anxiety. So anxiety is an evolutionarily adaptive mechanism that lets us know when we're in danger and keeps us safe. It works really, really well. It's been hardwired into our brain over thousands and thousands of years of evolution. We know that it's, we know kind of when it developed because it, it sits in our, in our oldest brain regions. And also um, the kinds of things that people are afraid of tell us a bit about when we developed it too. So for example, um, many, many more people are frightened of spiders and snakes than are frightened of kind of guns and bombs, right? Even though our, in our culture now, probably guns and bombs are much more dangerous than, than spiders and snakes. God, that's so true. <laughs> interesting. Psychology is really interesting, right? I want you to imagine that I'm a cave woman, okay? I'm out gathering food and doing my day-to-day -day stuff and I come across a lion. If I don't feel anxious, what's going to happen? Going to get eaten. Yeah, exactly. So you can see there how anxiety is useful, can't you? I need to figure out that something dangerous is here and, and realise that I've got to do something about it. Cool. What I'm going to do initially is I'm going to take a moment. I'm actually going to freeze and keep really still. What I'm doing is all of my attention is hijacked. I'm not concentrating at all on the food I'm gathering anymore. I'm completely focused on the lion, like tunnel vision. And... Um, my pupils dilate so I can see in really high detail. I can take in loads of information. And, and above all else, I've got to keep still. So in that moment, I blend in. I guess what I'm hoping here is that the lion might not even spot me and might move on. But in that moment, what, when I'm thinking, I need to not draw attention to myself. So, like, what next? Once I've taken a moment to freeze and decide what I'm going to do, I've got to do one of two things, really. I've either got to fight the lion or I've got to run away. If I'm quite big and strong and I stand a good chance, I'm going to choose fight. Or if I'm defending something like a baby, for example, I'm going to choose fight. If I'm on my own or I'm a bit smaller, my best chance is just going to be to run away. OK, either way, my body's got to get me into its kind of strongest, fittest, fastest position. So my heart rate's going to go up, um, my blood pressure's going to go up, I'm going to be diverting blood away from kind of unimportant things like digestion into my muscles so that I'm strong and fit to, to either fight or to run. My pituitary gland is going to release adrenaline and cortisol, so they're stress hormones that get me ready to go, and they also are natural painkillers so that I can tolerate how uncomfortable it all feels while it's happening. Other stuff is going to happen, so my breathing is going to change to get more oxygen into the system, and that can give me kind of an odd feeling of being a bit lightheaded or dizzy. Anxiety is the name that we give to how we experience all of those physical changes. So, for example, feeling um, hot, sweaty, like a racing, racing, hammering heart, feeling a bit shaky, having butterflies in our tummy, and feeling totally focused on, on the threat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But like there aren't really many lions nowadays, so what do we get like scared of now? That's a that's a really fair question. So we've got to think about what would be a threat now in the modern world. Anything that anything that's kind of physically dangerous would be so for example being in an accident or being robbed, that would understandably cause a lot of anxiety. Um we're very social creatures, our our survival depends on being part of the pack and being accepted into a group. So actually a lot of threat now will be anything that's social related. So, for example, giving a speech to a lot of people or performing karaoke or something like that or speaking up in front of a group. That would all cause people a lot of a lot of anxiety. The other thing that's worth saying about what we find threatening in the current world um, is about the, the ongoing evolution of our brain. So we ha now have all kinds of brain areas that we didn't have at the time when we were hardwiring this anxiety response okay so when we were really first learning in evolution how to do this this threat response we were probably kind of much more similar to reptiles than, than, than mammal or human brains what our brains can do now is it can conjure up stuff that's not actually there so it can it can remember things from the past it can imagine things going wrong in the future it can think over things that feel uncomfortable or painful our old brain where where the anxiety threat response is is not great at telling apart the difference between something real versus something we're imagining 
So while our new brain is very clever and does lots of really good stuff for us, it does unfortunately mean that we can kind of put ourselves into a state of anxiety just with what we're thinking about all the time. So a lot of kind of stress now is simply from the fact that our, our brain is almost too clever for our old brain to cope with. And so we trigger off our own threat system just so from thinking. Not even real worry. That's exactly right. So we might be not even in the present at all. We might be thinking about something that could go wrong or something that has go wrong or something that might never happen. But not real. So what like different kinds of things could you get anxiety over? You can get anxiety over loads and loads of different stuff. Um, phobias, for example, is when you're very frightened about one particular thing, but it can be anything. It could be dogs or flying, or heights or needles, buttons or all kinds of stuff that most of us don't think are dangerous, right? Phobias come from overestimating the threat or the danger associated with the thing and underestimating your own ability to cope with it. And then that leads you to feeling really, really frightened. But there are lots of other anxiety disorders as well. So for example, health anxiety is when we start to get really worried that maybe there's something wrong with our health, even if doctors and tests show nothing. So for example, if I'm really worried that I have cancer, I might start checking my body a lot. I might start reading up on the internet. I might start noticing signs and symptoms of anxiety, like fight flight that we talked about and misinterpreting those as a sign that there's something wrong. So for example, thinking that my heart shouldn't be racing like this and is this a sign of, of cancer, for example. So things that aren't really there that we think They are, are there, but we get muddled about what's caused them and we worry that something really bad has caused them. So we can get into a vicious cycle. Another similar one is, is panic disorder. So that's when somebody notices a, a normal, different sensation that probably means nothing at all like like a flutter in your heart or tingles in your fingers and and worry that it's an imminent threat worry that it's like a sign that you're having a stroke or a heart attack or something that's going to kill you straight away in which case what actually happens that's what people worry is going to happen it never does happen what happens is people get so anxious that that something really scary is about to happen that they get loads more anxiety symptoms and they end up in a full full panic attack you can probably imagine that if people have panic attacks that they, they're so horrible that then they want to avoid going out or want to avoid anything that's going to trigger it off yeah. or want to avoid being in a situation where it would be embarrassing if they had a panic attack. We call that agoraphobia. Social anxiety is an is a interesting one. Social anxiety is one where we know that without treatment it can go on and on and on for years. Social anxiety is when the person is really frightened that they're going to do or say something embarrassing or humiliating and that people are going to judge them or laugh at them or reject them. It can include being worried that you're going to come across as anxious. So again, we get that vicious cycle of being frightened we're going to look anxious and then being more anxious. But doesn't everyone have that? Everyone has it to a certain extent, I suppose. Yeah. I guess it becomes a problem if it's so extreme that you, you can't be yourself or you're always having to watch or monitor or censor what you're saying, or you kind of can't go for things you want to do, like you're held back in your job or in your career because you don't dare do things in front of people. That would be when I suppose it's a problem. Separation anxiety is a particularly important one when we're working with children and adolescents. Um, so separation anxiety is when we're really frightened that we're not going to be able to get to our parent or carer or if they're away from us that something really bad is going to happen to them. What we see across the lifespan is that people are anxious naturally about different things at different stages in their life. When we're children it's typically monsters and then it might be um, bad things happening and then it might be social anxiety and then sort of death and illness is more, more typical as you get older. And that just really speaks to kind of our experience in the world based on the age we are. So what kind of things cause people to develop anxiety? Well, that's a really good question and actually is really hard to answer because individual difference means that what's true for one person might be completely different for another. Psychology and psychiatry early on spent a lot of time focusing on what has caused this, why do we think this has happened? But unfortunately, that varies so much from person to person that it's hard to develop a treatment around it. But also, the thing that caused it 
back in the past might be something you can do nothing about at all now. So, so it doesn't allow you to, to know what to change in the present. We've made a lot of leaps and bounds with anxiety treatment now that we instead focus on why am I still anxious? What's keeping it going in the here and now? What we do is we figure out why this has carried on, then we know what to change, and then you can get over your anxiety in the present. So in terms of thinking about what keeps an anxiety going, a really, really important thing to look at is avoidance. You can totally understand why if something is very scary, a person just wants to avoid it. Or if they're stuck in that situation, run away and escape from the situation. The problem with avoidance is two things, really. The first is you, you never find out um, that the thing is not dangerous. So that belief never gets updated or changed. And the second thing is that um, you never habituate to the fear. Habituation is a really clever mechanism built into our threat system, so it knows when to switch off. Let's talk about that lion again. Let's say I see some animal that looks a bit like a lion. I've never actually seen it before, but that's the most similar thing I can think of. You can understand that immediately I'm going to feel really, really anxious, and that is sensible and that is safe. But over time, as I figure out that it's not actually dangerous to me, I need to be able to switch off my anxiety and my threat system and go about my day. I need to go back to collecting food or whatever I was doing before. So this, that's what habituation is. If you're in a situation for a while, nothing bad has happened, your threat system realises and just switches off. If somebody is avoiding all the time, they never get to that point. So they remain anxious about that thing. In fact, it goes even further. If you run out of a terrifying situation, you feel relief. That's negative reinforcement. That's taking away something that was really horrible. And of course, what we know about reinforcement is you're then going to do that behaviour over and over again. So people can get quite stuck in a cycle of avoidance when what they really need to do is, is go and face the situation. That means that one major treatment for anxiety is graded exposure. Starting off with something a bit scary, building up your confidence, realising you can cope and building up and doing more and more scary things as you go along until you can completely face your fear. So if you're not constantly avoiding social interaction for social anxiety, how come that can carry on for like quite a long amount of time? That's a really, really good question. It baffled psychologists for a long time. So if you're doing thing over and over again, you should surely figure out that it's not dangerous. Why doesn't the anxiety go away? And the crucial thing we've discovered is a thing called safety behaviours. So safety behaviours is what we do to try and make sure our worry doesn't come true. The problem with it is it, is it actually protects our worry. It turns every safe or benign experience into a near miss. So we don't learn that it was fine. We start to say to ourselves, that was only fine because dot, dot, dot. Let me give you an example. Um, I'm actually totally frightened of vampires. They're terrifying. They completely ruin your life. And there's lots of evidence for vampires. I mean, every culture throughout history across the world has written about them. I'm not sure why other people don't take it a bit more seriously. <laughs> so what I do is I eat garlic at every meal. I carry garlic in my bag. I've got garlic with me at all times. But there's no vampires. Well, that's because my garlic's working really well. Do you see what I've done here? So instead of starting to realise that my belief was wrong all along, I'm starting to give credit to the behaviours I'm doing. So I think I'm only safe because I'm doing those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what treatment is there for anxiety? Well, the treatment with the most evidence that it works is cognitive behavioural therapy. And what you would do is a whole range of things that help you test and challenge those beliefs. So for example, you might do surveys to ask people what they really think rather than kind of guessing. You might do video or photo feedback to, to check on the pictures in your head and how realistic and fair they are. Um, you, might, you might do work around attention. So noticing that you've started paying attention to the thing you're frightened of in a very particular way, like all your attention is on it or you're checking it or scanning for it or watching for it. And what we would do is experiment with how, how that makes you feel, whether it improves things, whether it allows you to get on with your life, and perhaps do some attention training if that's a problem. And finally, and most importantly, we would do something called a behavioural experiment, and we would do these over and over and over again in treatment. 
what we look for is what am I worried is going to happen and how do I test that? So I would put myself in the situation, drop my safety behaviours and observe what really happens. And that allows us to kind of update our information and check out that belief. Here is an example of a behavioural experiment. Kirsty is frightened of heights, thinking that she will fall off or jump over the edge. We found somewhere with high walkways for Kirsty to test out her concerns. I'm, I'm really impressed with you, Kirsty, because you've picked a table obviously quite near the near the edge. So we've got started with the challenges. Yeah. I have noticed there's a couple of safety behaviours. Can you say what they are? Maybe that I'm sitting over this side of the chair and I don't really want to sit back. And you've totally not looked around once, have you? Not a lot. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I guess first thing we're going to do while we're just here to make use of this time is I'm going to get you to move your chair back to the edge, try and relax your body, drop any safety waves, maybe move your arms, allow yourself to kind of have your central gravity to move a bit, okay. all those kinds of things. We could take your coat on and off, any of those things we talked about. Yeah. Good job, just have a real nice look. That's fab, well done. So allowing yourself just to move around. Yeah, good. Okay, good, how does that feel? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Better than you thought? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good for you, well done. So should we plan our experiments? Yep. So um, we've already run through some of those fears, so, so I, maybe I'll recap them and you let me know if I've got them right. Yeah. Um, so we know when you get up top and you've got a drop, you're thinking, I'm, I'm going to have a panic attack, um, I'm going to lose, lose control and jump off, I'm going to um, get caught by a bluster wind or trip or fall. And as a result, what are your safety behaviours, do you reckon? Um, normally... Well, I wouldn't go somewhere like that on my own, so I'd probably grab hold of somebody or hold right. their yeah. arm. Yeah. Um, tend not to look, or just look for where the edges are. Right. But not really go near them. Right. So you don't, you're not looking at the view, you're looking at the edge? No, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Interesting, interesting about your focus of attention there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. So not paying attention to the vast majority of the world or the good bits or the pleasure of it or, or that nobody else has fallen off. Yeah. Just looking at the edge, just yeah. that scary bit. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so we're going to be getting you to not grip on, stand on your own, move around, move to the edge, take your focus of attention off the floor, have a good look up and around, look at the view. Okay. Yeah. The idea of a behavioural experiment is to put yourself in a situation that will trigger your concerns and cause you to feel anxious. It's important to identify and drop as many safety behaviours as possible. It can be helpful to do this with someone else because safety behaviours are often so automatic that we don't even realise we're doing them. Kirsty avoids high places like this whenever possible, but if it's unavoidable, she would do several safety behaviours. She would hurry across as quickly as possible, stare at the edges or straight ahead, and keep hold of someone that was with her. These are the behaviours that Kirsty believes keep her safe. So when I ask her to slow down to a normal pace and look up and around, she's actually more anxious at first. This is good because it means she's really facing her fear. Kirsty was pleased and relieved the first time she managed to walk over the bridge, but we repeated this over and over until her anxiety started to come down. We call this habituation. After a while, Kirsty is ready to challenge herself further. She walks right over to the edge, which is something she hasn't been able to do for a long time. Kirsty's done really well in her session today, and we'll do several more experiments like this across treatment.
When she first came to therapy, Kirsty didn't believe any of this would be possible. But now she's able to go to high places without the same level of anxiety and really enjoy the scenery for the first time in years. If you or someone you know is affected by the issues raised in this film, there are places that you can go for help and support. There is a lot of information available on the internet which can sometimes be confusing or misleading. In the links below this film, you can find a list of some trusted organisations that publish high quality, reliable information and give advice on evidence-based treatments.